everyone, let's keep going. This time I'm going to talk about the Gansfeld experiment that Wu has been referencing quite a lot, but that's coming up a little later. First, more butthurt complaints. Argument 17. Experiments that show positive results for psi must be replicable to count as evidence. Of course, it's called the scientific method. All experiments must be reproducible. Why would a different standard apply here? I feel like we've been over this. While this standard may seem reasonable scientifically, it's usually just another tactic to try to raise the bar, because no matter how many times a successful psi experiment is replicated, they will still demand a never-ending higher rate of replication. And why is that a problem? Again, why should a different standard apply here, if you acknowledge that this is a reasonable scientific standard? No matter what, they never concede that they are wrong and will use every slimy tactic they can to deny what they don't believe in. If cornered, they will change the topic or rant about something else. That's just the way they are. Oh, the irony. Dude, you are at least as butthurt as a ten-year-old Catholic boy who just came home from choir practice. Skeptics can see that they're wrong all the time. That's why science works. It's not dogmatic. It changes as we learn more. The reason we don't change our minds about specific issues is that the evidence is insufficient to compel us to do so. For example, if the allegedly successful experiments can't be replicated. The first problem with this argument is that just because something hasn't been replicated doesn't mean it didn't happen. For example, if an Olympic track and field runner breaks a world record and other athletes don't repeat it, it doesn't mean that it never happened. But if it happens and there's no record of it, no one will know about it. There are agreements regarding what constitutes a sufficient record of, well, a record. For one, it has to be set under observation by the appropriate authorities. In science, that's not enough because we don't want to have to rely on any authority. Isn't that your whole problem with mainstream science? You think the man is keeping you down? You don't trust this perceived authority, which actually doesn't even exist? This should make you even more eager to show that your experimental results can be replicated, even under the strictest controls. Similarly, phenomena such as supernovas, balls of lightning, and comets are outer phenomena not replicable under our control, but are acknowledged to exist anyway. Even if we can't reproduce the phenomena, we can still replicate the studies. We can make predictions about the mechanisms involved and test those predictions applied to phenomena that we can reproduce. We can also make repeated observations. We can't create a comet, but we can see them with telescopes and predict their orbits. Additional observations will confirm or falsify those predictions. Therefore, replicating the appearance of UFOs or ghosts may not be possible because they are out of our control, but that doesn't mean they never happen or don't exist. Right, but no one is making that argument. Believers are saying that they do exist, but they consistently fail to present any evidence to back that up. How do you not get this? I don't believe you doesn't necessarily mean I believe you are wrong. I don't believe A does not imply I believe not A. All it would take is one genuine case of a UFO or ghost to prove that they are real and possible. As an unnamed law says, if it happens once, then it is possible. Right, so feel free to come back when you can show a genuine case. In fact, the very nature of psychic phenomena makes them not easy to replicate. Dean Radin, PhD, director of the Consciousness Research Laboratory at the University of Nevada, and author of The Conscious Universe, The Scientific Truth of Psychic Phenomena, lists eight reasons why this is so. I'd say that gives me at least eight reasons to reject this as complete nonsense. 1. The phenomenon may not be replicable. If it can't be replicated and leaves no objective way to verify it, then it shouldn't be believed. 2. The written experimental procedures may be incomplete, or the skills needed to perform the replication may not be well understood. So I should lower my standard of evidence because you're incompetent? 3. The effect under study may change over time or react to the experimental procedure. Then experiments should verify this. 4. Investigators may inadvertently affect the results of their experiments. That's what controls are for, you know, like blinding protocols. 5. Experiments sometimes fail for sociological reasons. There can be many reasons why an experiment fails. If you don't get conclusive results, then you try again, or redesign the experiment if necessary. 6. There are psychological reasons that prevent replications from being easy to conduct. 
Why would there be? It sounds like a problem with the experimental design. In other words, incompetence. 7. The statistical aspects of replication are much more confusing than more people think. So, again, you're incompetent. And 78. Complications in experimental design affect some replications. Then design better experiments. Incompetence is no excuse. The second problem with this argument is that successful psi experiments definitely have been replicated by different researchers and laboratories. Here we go. One famous solid example is the series of telepathy studies known as the Gansfeld experiments, in which subjects guess target images while sitting with ping pong ball halves over their eyes and listening to relaxing white noise designed to deprive them of sensory stimuli to heighten their intuition and psychic abilities. These have been replicated for decades. With absolutely no results indicative of telepathy. Thus, from all this, it is indisputable that we have solid scientific and statistical evidence that one of the most successful and controlled series of telepathy experiments in history, the Gansfeld experiments, were definitely replicable. These experiments were not successful. Let me explain. You take a person, the receiver, and put him in a dark room and blindfold him, and have him listen to white noise and headphones. If this is done correctly, then he obviously can't see or hear what's going on in the next room. Now in that room there's another person, the sender, looking at one of four distinct pictures. Now the point is, can the receiver tell which picture the sender was looking at? Chance predicts a 25% success rate, obviously, but these experiments have a significantly higher success rate. A meta-analysis says 35% apparently. Let's be generous and accept this as an accurate analysis. Given the number of experiments carried out, over 2000, chance can't realistically account for a 35% success rate. But this means that something other than chance was at work. It doesn't even hint at this being telepathy. For one, the experiments have been criticized for using piss-poor controls. I mean, seriously, why was there a need for an auto-Gansfeld? You know, the version of the experiment where a computer picks the picture at random. Why wasn't the picture picked at random to start out with? That's the quality of this research. And why can't the sender be in another building? I mean, let's completely eliminate the possibility of sensory leakage. If there's no cheating going on, then why is this point of criticism something that even needs to be brought up? This should be the standard procedure, but you know what? This isn't even the stupid part. Shouldn't there be a 100% success rate if telepathy is for real? Or maybe only some people are telepathic. Oh, okay, fine. then. Wouldn't we be able to just do an initial test to find out who's telepathic and then repeat the test with just telepaths? Shouldn't that second test and any further tests involving these people have a 100% success rate? Okay, let's be fair, human error is always possible, so let's say 80% just to be on the ridiculously safe side. No. Apparently not. That's the thing about parapsychology. There's no attempt to move forward. There's no attempt to explain anything. And there are never any useful results. The search for an answer stops at, here's something that can't be explained by chance. Sounds to me like that's where the search should begin. But then of course you wouldn't necessarily reach the desired conclusion. Therefore, the skeptical challenge has been met and it's up to them to accept the obvious data or reject it. Oh, you misunderstand. It's not the data we reject. It's the conclusion. See you next time.